Hey, I'm Cray and over the past 5 years I've attempted over 18 Nuzlocks and I've managed to fail every single one of them. But today, that changes. Hopefully. Now before we get into it, let's just quickly go through the rules of a Nuzlocke. You already probably know this by now if you've already watched videos like this in the past, but for the small minority that don't, here's what's up. First of all, the standard Nuzlocke rules do apply. You can only catch the first Pokemon on any given route, failure to do so and you forfeit your encounter for that route. If a Pokemon faints, it's considered unusable and must be placed in the PC or release. You must give every Pokemon a nickname to strengthen your bond with them, and since this will be a hardcore Nuzlocke, we have a few extra rulings to cover. First of all, set mode will be enabled, meaning we can't get a free switch after KOing a Pokemon. Secondly, the level cap will be enforced. My mons have to either be on par or under the level of the gym leader's ace, or I can't use them in battle, with one exception to that rule which I'll get into a bit later. And finally, items are not allowed in battle. This only applies to items used from the bag such as potions, X items, you get the idea. Items that the Pokemon themselves can use such as berries and other held items are allowed. Now with all of that said, let's get started. Our journey begins in the comfort of New Barktown, with our mother letting us know that the professor was looking for us, all the whilst not shutting up about the poker gear that we already know how to use. So after we talk to the locals and get assaulted by a random redhead, we make our way to the Pokemon lab to obtain our starter Pokemon. For this run I chose Tortodile who I named Rage, after the strategy we planned to implement in the early game, and with that we were off to visit Mr Pokemon's house a few routes over. Once we fended off the wild Pokemon in the area and obtained the map card from the old man in Cherry Grove, we eventually made it to Mr Pokemon's house, where we met both him and none other than Professor Oak. Seeing our potential as a trainer, Professor Oak gives us the Pokedex as well as the egg from Mr Pokemon allowing us to return home. On the way back, we receive a call from a frantic Professor Elm and run into the same guy from before who proceeds to challenge us to a Pokemon battle. After kicking his Chikorita's ass with Scratch, he runs away and we make it back to the Pokemon lab to find out our rival had stolen the Pokemon from the Professor. I name him Failure and not so subtle representation of what he has to face coming off 18 losses. After this, the Professor's assistant gives us some Pokeballs and now the run officially begins. With everything set, we begin the trek to Violet City as well as catching our first encounter of the run on Route 29, Sentry, who I named Senna. A nice aspect of Jota I found is that there's quite a few routes you can explore before you even make it to the first town. So that's what we did, keen to add more members to the team. And on Route 30, we met our second encounter, Spiro. I was extremely excited at the prospect of having a Firo so early on. However, after Spiro broke out of a few balls, an attempt to weaken it resulted in a critical hit. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. I had a feeling we were going to get bent over by a critical hit at some point, I just didn't expect it to be this early on. It wasn't all bad though as our next encounter was a Pidgey who I named Buddy. I would have preferred a Spearow but I guess Pidgeot is cool too. After a little bit of training and taking out the first few trainers who cross our path, we head to the Dark Cave and catch our next team member, Roxanne the Geodude, and also our Kakuna, Paperweight, on the very next route. Slowly the team was forming and I felt my confidence growing going into Faulkner. Before that though, we still had the Bellsprout Tower to contend with and this is honestly where I messed up. You see going in, I completely forgot about how many battles there actually was going through, and since most of the team were around level 8 just a level under the level cap at this point, you can probably tell just how finicky this ended up being. For the most part it wasn't too bad, we battled and passed the trainers as we made our way to the top, all the while fiddling around with our team to make sure nobody passed the level cap. We observed failure beating up the old man, and I talked to him thinking he was just going to give me the HM. I haven't played generation 2 in almost 10 years, and this battle against the sage completely blindsided me I have to be honest. The battle begins and Sage Lee brings out his spell sprout and immediately uses growth. We send out Senate and of course he misses the tackle. That alone sets the tone for this entire battle. I decide it's best to switch into Buddy and he eats a critical hit Vine Whip. Buddy responds with Gust that drops spell sprout's HP below half. After eating another Vine Whip, we finish it off and Buddy levels up beyond the level cap, making him ineligible for Faulkner. I didn't really plan on using him to be honest, but it was still a blow in the moment. Next, the Sage brings out his Hoo Hoo and we use a few Sand Attacks to try and cheese our way through. Not wanting Buddy to get bodied being at half HP, we switch into Roxanne hoping her defence is enough to withstand the punishment and dish it back out with a tackle. The Sand Attacks do pay dividends here and just to be on the safe side we use Defence Kill to raise her defence, while she whittles down the Hoo Hoo gradually until it eventually falls. This is where the battle gets weird, and I still haven't the slightest why this happened. His final Pokemon was of course another Bellsprout, and Roxanne goes down to a single Fine Whip. The reason why I didn't switch out originally is because I didn't want anybody else going over the level cap due to my poor level management, and with no other choice I switched into Paperweight intending to use it as a clean switch. Until this happened. The only thing we can actually do with Paperweight is hard and right, and so that's what we did. Fine Whip barely does any damage because of the resistance to grass, and we continue to use hard and wait until it inevitably takes us out. But then it 
it starts using Fire Whip and spans Grow for some reason. I don't know why this happened at the time and I still don't. Maybe it ran out of PP. So for the next 10 minutes we continue to use Harden and the Bell Sprout spans growth. We can't damage each other and our respective stats won't go any higher. Eventually we run out of PP and we can attack with Struggle which ends up winning us the battle with Paperweight down to a final few HP. You couldn't honestly make this up and you know what? Paperweight, it's time I put some respect on your name. It sucks we had a death so early on, but in hindsight it was my own poor level management that led to it in the first place, so I can't complain. So before we head into the Violet City Gym, we go back to the Spirit Tower and add our newest member to the team, Cursefish the Gasler. With our first gym challenge in sight, we take Cursefish to the previous routes to train her up, and after taking out the first three gym trainers in our way, it was time to earn our first gym badge. Now Falcon's team isn't anything too special, consisting of a level 7 Pidgey and a level 9 Pidgeot. Cheating much? The Pidgey should go down without any trouble, but they can be annoying as they both use Mud Slap that can lower your accuracy, and Pidgeot's will stab Gust can be a problem, just due to how little resources you have at this point in the game. Naturally, we lead with Rage, with my entire strategy just being the Rage strats. Since both of Faulkner's Mons only have damage dealing moves, it was a guaranteed boost for Rage each turn, and with no trouble at all, his team went down in a clean sweep, granting us the Cephal Badge. After clipping Faulkner's birds, we head to the Pokemon Center and take the egg from Elm's assistant. Straight into the PC it goes. From here, we explore the surrounding routes we haven't been to yet for our next three encounters, all the while taking out any challenges along the way, recruiting both Whoopoop the Hooper and Ice Spy the Unknown to the group from Route 32 and the Runes of Alf respectively. We encounter a strange man offering us a slowpoke tail for a hefty fee, and of course obtain the Old Rod which grants us fishing encounters in towns, providing us even more opportunities to expand our team. It was also around this time when we caught Nathan the Retata from the Union Cave and Jesse the Ekans of Route 33 after eventually finding our way out of said cave. Eventually, we bump into a shady looking guy blocking the entrance to the well, so we continue on our merry way to Azalea Town. Our first order of business was to head to the small house on the outskirts of town and meet Kurt, an old man with a knack for creating custom Pokeballs. Kurt gives us a rundown on Team Rocket's agenda and leaves his granddaughter to confront them at the well. After a little bit of shopping, we follow suit to provide some assistance, only to be forced to take matters into our own hands because the old man hurt his back. Regardless, the Team Rocket grunts that stood in our way went down pretty quickly and we were able to obtain our next encounter, Patrick the Slowpork. With the Slowpork residence now saved, we head back to Azalea Town to take on our next gym battle. Now when it came to bugs it, I was a bit nervous. Whilst this Kakuna and Metapods are jokes, that Cypher is anything but. Thankfully, I did have a strategy and it worked out flawlessly. This was the crowning achievement of the Nuzlocke for me so far, as I finally got over one of the hurdles that held me back for so many attempts, implementing strategy and considering all of the tools at my disposal. Before all that, I boxed Wupoop for Paperweight as a failsafe just in case my initial plan didn't work out. The last thing I wanted was to lose a precious Mon, so using Paperweight as a guaranteed free switch was just too good not to pass up on. First that led me buddy and I was hoping that the Metapod wouldn't use String Shot, thankfully it went with Harden and the second Gust finished it off. Kakuna was a similar deal. Before the battle I gave Buddy a poison berry, just in case Kakuna's poison sting got lucky. However it didn't and the mom went down just as easily as the first. Now this is where the fun truly began. I knew most of my team resisted bug and so I planned to use that to my advantage. First things first though, I used sand attack twice with Buddy to lower Cypher's accuracy before switching out. One of Cypher's attacking moves, Fiori Cutter, grows stronger the more it connects. Like an opposite raid essentially. I planned to disrupt this with hacks and with his accuracy now minus 2, Crispish's time had finally come. I I switch into Cursefish, predicting the quick attack and we get to work. With Cursefish being a ghost type mon, the only attacking move Cypher could land was Fury Cutter, and with its accuracy now down the toilet, any attacks he landed would do peanuts against my beloved Gas Ball. I wasn't done yet though, as I needed to make sure I could win with Cursefish. To seal our victory, I used Spite until Fury Cutter run out of PP. Bugsy wouldn't use Quick Attack as Ghost is immune to it, and Leah wouldn't help out in this case either. Now with Cypher's best attacking option nullified, it was a painless, albeit long, process of whittling its health down with late to claim our second gym badge. Gym 2 was a success, but I knew the worst was yet to come. Thanks to the Hive Badge, the level cap had now been raised to level 20 and I was feeling good about our chances. Before moving on, I healed the team and re-added Wupoop to the party. Before we could depart, our rival Failure interrupts us and this is the first of many times where this arsehole catches me off guard. Nevertheless, we battle and it was pretty annoying. Failure brings out his Gaslight and we start with Rage. His lick does barely any damage and we land a critical hit water gun in response. So far so good. Upon eating a second lick, Rage finishes off the Gaslight and he brings out his newly evolved Bearleaf. 
Having little choice, we switch Rage for Buddy and Bayleaf uses Reflect to raise its defense. Not the best situation to be in, I gotta be honest. Regardless, we go for Ghost and the Bayleaf outspeeds with Razor Leaf. Despite resisting Grass, it still does a fair amount whilst Bayleaf eats the Ghost thanks to the Reflect. He goes for Razor Leaf again and it hits relatively well. Instead of Ghost, Buddy uses Sand Attack hoping to catch a lucky break. Unfortunately, he hits again and Buddy is close to the crit range at this point. I persist with the Sand Attack and eventually it starts paying dividends. In hindsight, I probably would have been better off going for Ghost here. It's just that the reflect put me off from doing so. Eventually they reflect more off and Buddy was able to hit harder with Ghost. All the while Bayleaf missed thanks to the minus 3 accuracy. To compensate Bayleaf uses Growl but by this point it's too little too late. It finally goes down to a crit and failure brings out his final Pokemon. Too weak to continue I switched Buddy out for Crisfish against his Subar only to realise the error I made. You see before the battle with Bugsy I was training Crisfish against the Subar and the surrounding roots and none of them used Bite. I kind of forgot it learns it. Fortunately nothing bad comes from it and we switch out into Senny who evolved into Fury during my last grind session. Unfortunately, Subat lands Supersonic and we switch into Rage. I wasn't really willing to risk dying from Confuse Hacks. I tried a Rage Strat again and it wasn't really working since Subat kept going for Supersonic and missing. Regardless, we were still doing alright damage. Eventually, I switched to Water Gun and the bloody Subat lands the Supersonic and Rage hurts itself. Seriously, I had to connect now? We switch back to Senate and with a number of powerful quick attacks, we finally overcome our rival. In hindsight, I did make it harder on myself, insisting on using Rage instead of Water Gun. We most likely would have killed before the Supersonic finally hit, but this could have been far worse. Buddy even evolved into a Pidgeotto, so I was in high spirits regardless. After failure's usual stick of behaving like a teenage girl during the emo phase, we push on from Azalea and head into the Ilex Forest. Once we help the Tree Cutter's apprentice retrieve their prize Farfetch, they give us the Koei Chem so we can proceed onward. It's here we gain our next member of the team, CBD the Oddish. Never have I been so excited to see a grass type in my life. The way out of the forest took a while, however, we did obtain the headbutt from a man in the depths of it that we teach the Senny for the same type attack bonus. With only Route 34 standing between us and our next gym battle, we clean out the rest of the trainers and catch yet another Pokemon, a Drowsy who I named Mars. Not after the planet, by the way, the chocolate bar because of the chocolate coating on its feet. Before we head to the Goldenrod gym, I decide to take a detour to the radio tower and take the quiz for the radio card, then grinding up the team through the underground market whilst pondering over a strategy to take out Whitney. Throughout this training session, Rage evolved into a croc can know, which was truly appreciated. Everybody and their mothers know just how violent Winter can truly be, and in a Nuzlocke setting, yeah, she's just as brutal. It all comes down to her Miltank, a single evolution stage Pokemon that has absurd stats for how early it is in the game. Along with its already beefy advantage, its degenerate moveset of Attract, Milk Drink and Rollout will ensure a lengthy and brutal battle. In a casual setting, you could always trade for the Machop. Fortunately enough, we did have the Drowsy to trade, though I wasn't really shown this ruling since I didn't want to include static encounters. I guess a trade encounter is legit since I did get the required Pokemon on my first encounter. In the end though, I just stuck with my original team. Rollo looks very similar to Fury Cutter in a sense. Its attack does increase every turn, however the user's locked into the move until it misses, and then the attack resets. Since Cutfish is unaffected by Stomp, and also Attract being female, my strategy going in was to use her after lowering Miltank's accuracy, so we could stall the PP of Rollout and leave her defenceless. I wasn't entirely confident this would work going in. Regardless, this is how it went. To start, Whitney brings out her Clefairy and we open up with Senna. The Clefairy can be dangerous if she gets lucky with Metronome, however given how RNG dependent that actually is, it just didn't make sense to be overly cautious about it. So we hit hard with Headbutt which does more than half, and Metronome turns into Fate Attack with the Clefairy going down upon the second Headbutt. At this stage she brings out Miltank and I switch into CBD. The Miltank lands a crit with Rollout which isn't a good start. Instead of using Flash, I take a chance with Stun Spore, wanting to slow the Miltank down when it came to switching out, and it worked. Given the damage CBD took, we switch into Rage and Rollout hits him for almost half of his health. Maybe I should have just used Flash, but given the damage Rage took, that would have finished CBD off for sure. After many minutes of deliberation, we eventually return to Senna because of its HP and defense stat. At this point, I'm hoping the Paralyzed pays dividends and stops Rollout. Unfortunately, it doesn't, but the Rollout missed giving us the opening we need. Senna uses Headbutt to try and get the flinch. It doesn't work and Miltank responds with a stomp which hits very hard. With Rollout no reset, I decide it's time to switch into Cutfish to play around the stomp and at least force a Rollout so we can reduce the PP with Spite. The responding stomp is outed and we use Spite. Miltank is then paralyzed and Cutfish responds with another Spite. This happens again as Miltank is still affected by paralysis. The following turn she goes for Milk Drink and we continue using Spite to reduce her PP and at this stage I thought it was working well. Eventually she goes back to Rollout and we just continue with 
use Spite since we can't attack her anyway. The second rollout hits extremely hard though and pops our berry. We get the Spite off again but the writing is on the wall now, a clean switch is needed. With her heavy heart, we send Cursefish her marching orders for a final Spite, that lowers rollout's PP by 5, a final act of defiance for my beloved gas ball. Miltank takes out Cursefish, granting the opportunity for a clean switch and in response we switch into CBD. In order to heal some of the damage we've took, we go for Absorb, hoping to dent the full health of the Miltank. I wasn't expecting much here, but even with the boost from the Miracle Seed, it barely scratched the surface. With the Paralysis coming in clutch, we take this opportunity to lower its accuracy with Flash, and after a second turn of Paralysis, we do so again. Even with all of this, she still finds a way to hit through with Stomp, bringing CBD into the red, forcing a switch out into Rage. The next Stomp misses and Rage responds with a water gun that still barely leaves a mark. Miltank then goes for a Tract, however it fails. After another water gun we begin to gradually bring the Miltank down to her knees, and after another missed stomp I thought we were in the clear, until she relentlessly reversed all of our progress with another milk drink. With no other options, Rage continues to attack with water gun, and when the responding stomp brings him into the crit range, we are once again forced to switch out. At this point I was hoping for Jessie's bite to flinch, and while she did land a few hits and even a crit that brought Miltank into the red, the latter ultimately finished her off leading to our second casualty. Jessie did not fall in fear however, as Sunny is brought out once more and with a final headbutt, Whitney and her mill tank finally go down. What a stubborn, stubborn cow. Eventually, Whitney gets over a tantrum and we obtain the plane badge, though it wasn't without a price. No, could I have played that battle any differently? Possibly. I definitely think going for the flash before the stun spore was the player looking back. In the moment though, I was very cautious just knowing how dangerous that mill tank is, and once Kusfish went down, I panicked. Jesse almost got the job done and if I was a bit luckier and got the flinch a few times, it would have been different. However, that's the way the cookie crumbles. I'm still happy with the choices made since Kusfish definitely had an expiry date on the team. With no access to trade evolution, she would have to have been replaced eventually, and as unfortunate as Jessie's downfall was as well, I definitely felt at the time, she had the least amount of longevity given her pure poison typing and her access to other poison types. We overcame a major hurdle in Whitney though, so in that sense I was definitely feeling optimistic going forward, despite how bittersweet this whole ordeal was. Before departing from Goldenrod, we say our final goodbye to both Cusfish and Jessie, adding both Patrick and Whoopoo back to the team to make up the ranks. We then buy a few TMs from the department store for the road ahead. Stopping by the flower shop, the nice lady gives us a squid bottle so we can deal with the pseudo weirdo blocking the path to the next fruit, and with everything we need, we move forward. Whoopoop also evolved around this time into a quagsire, after a few more hours of training along Route 34. With a new route and a fresh start, we clear out the trainers in our way, all the while switch training the new members. For our encounter, I caught a male Nidoran who I named King, sorry for being so unoriginal, and things finally started to look up. We even caught a Nidoran female on the next route, continuing the tradition as our queen. I mulled it over for a while and decided Dude's Claws wasn't really valid here, since they are technically two completely different Pokemon with separate evolutionary lines. Along the National Park, we encounter a Sunkern who I named Sunny D. After the drink, get that dirty thought out of your head right now. Taking out the remaining trainers, we finally reach the pseudo Wudo who gets slapped by Whoopoop. From this point, I decide to backtrack to Violet City in order to catch our fishing encounter, Dreamcast the Polywag. Before moving through Route 37 en route to Ecruteek City, even with the Duke's Claws in effect, we net another Pidgey I call Penny, finally reaching our next destination. Now one thing I noticed right away is that there's a lot to do in Ecruteek City, kind of overwhelming in all honesty. I go to the Pokemon Centre first to heal and encounter Bill for a brief moment, so with little expectation I decided to head for the Burnt Tower to at least get our next encounter, only for failure to once again blindsight me with another battle. It's honestly a good thing we healed. Failure started off with Haunter and since I was switch training Patrick at the time, I was forced to concede the first move of a switch into Rage. Thankfully it doesn't really bite us in the arse as Haunter inflicts a curse upon Rage. We go for Bite and the Haunter outspeeds paralyzing Rage with Lick. Still, our Bite connects and Haunter hangs on by a thread. With the curse and status ailment taking their toll, we are forced to switch into CBD who takes down the Haunter with Absorb after eating a few licks. Magnemite is out next and hits hard with Sonic Boom. After I stupidly go for Poison Powder forgetting the fact Magnemite is part of Steel. Not my proudest moment. This naturally forces a switch on our end into Whoopoop with her immunity to electric attacks. The following Sonic Boom misses and Whoopoop lands her slam dealing decent damage. Again, Mandamite goes for Sonic Boom that connects this time around. We go for slam again and connect, only to be hit by Super Sonic the next turn, forcing another switch into Senna. The Sonic Booms continue and we finally take out the Magnemite with Quick Attack. Even with this battle not going so well, the tides eventually turn in our favour as Subite is brought out. Senny lands hard with a headbutt bringing the bat down to the red and flinching, sealing its fate. Bailey finally makes his reappearance and Senny strikes first with a crit headbutt that brings him down to the yellow. Bailey responds with razor leaves that knocks Senny to around half as well. Regardless, another headbutt was all it took for failure's final Pokemon to fall down, granting us the victory. 
Failure leaves and we are free to get our burnt tower encounter, a coffin guy appropriately named Global Warming. Now we've come out of the way, after a little bit of grinding and an extremely close encounter with the Kimono girls obtaining Surf, it was time to prepare for our fortune battle. CBD evolved into Gloom at this stage whilst we gathered a few more encounters from the surrounding routes. We finally got our hands on a Spearow along Route 42 that I named Jack, and whilst exploring Mount Marta, we caught another Rattata named Rat, alongside our Ecrity fishing encounter, Hydra the Magic Cart. Being honest, preparing for this gym battle was pretty tricky. With Jesse meeting her in against Whitney, my first strategy was out the window. Don't get me wrong, Rage at this point knew bite as well, giving us a super effective attack. However, I wasn't exactly confident that this would be enough, especially when considering Marty's strategy. Between Marty and Whitney, I definitely think she's a tougher opponent simply because her strategy is more consistent. Don't get it twisted though, Marty can be just as troublesome if the circumstances go his way. The Ecritique City gym leader relies on a sleep hack strategy. Several of his mons know hypnosis as well as dream meter and mean luck. All of these culminate in the aim of locking you into the battle with mean luck before rendering you immobile as he gradually takes you out with the hypnosis and dream meter combo. Needless to say, if I wanted an easier time in the upcoming fight, I needed to find a way to deal with the sleep hacks. Fortunately enough though, there was a method. You see literally two routes away on Route 39, there's a berry that gives you the mint berry. For those of you that don't know, the mint berry in Gen 2 is basically the chestal berry from Gen 3 onwards. Give it to a Pokemon to hold and they'll wake up upon being put to sleep. On our way over to the berry tree, clearing out the trainers along the routes, we obtained our next two encounters. Fat Rat the Raticate on Route 38 and Gold the Meow from Route 39. With the mint berry, all that was left was to build the team. Team. Aside from Rage, nobody else on the squad really matched up well against Marty's team. I really didn't want to rely on one Pokemon given Marty's ace Gengar would surely outspeed. In the end, I remember Gyarados also learned Bite, and upon discovering it learned the move as soon as it evolved at level 20, Hydra was quickly added to the team. It took several hours, even with the speed up, but eventually our puny fish had evolved into the beloved Sea Dragon, and with this powerhouse on the team, we were finally ready to take down Marta. Before heading to the gym, I gave Hydra the Mint Berry instead of Rage. Even though Rage had slightly better special attack, the vastly superior speed stat of Hydra just felt like the better option in this case. I also brought Paperweight back on the team for a clean switch option, placing Buddy in the PC. To start, we lived with Rage and Marty called forth his Ghastly. We use speed and the gas ball goes down to a critical hit bite. Next out was Haunter and Rage stays out. Even though the Haunter did outspeed it went for Curse, reducing its HP to half and leaving it at the mercy of another bite. Haunter goes down and Marty brings out his ace, Gengar. Because of the Curse, I decided it's best to switch to Hydra, predicting he would go for Hypnosis, guaranteeing the clean switch. He does indeed go for Hypnosis and it misses thankfully. Despite outspeeding even Hydra, Gengar's Hypnosis misses a second time and we connect with a powerful Surf. The reason why I didn't go for Bite here was one of two reasons. For one, I wasn't sure if we could outspeed the Gengar, and if we didn't, it would be pretty useless without the flinch. Also when I thought about it, I wasn't sure what would do more damage in this case, a super effective bite or a stab surf. Our surf leaves Gengar just above half and we try for bite this time. The Gengar once again outspeeds and misses its third hypnosis in a row. Bite doesn't do as much as surf so Gengar survives in the red and after missing a fourth hypnosis Hydra finishes his ace off. Only his haunter remained and Hydra swiftly takes it out after eating the nightshade, awarding us the fog badge. This battle pretty much went as perfect as it could have. I was honestly shocked as to how easy it was in the end. Yeah, I was lucky avoiding 4 hypnosis in a row, however when you're relying on such an inconsistent strategy, it happens sometimes. A little bit of luck in a nuzlocke is always needed, and even if he did manage to get off the hypnosis, Morty would have needed to still land 2 for it to be effective because of the mint berry. In the end, we planned diligently for his team and it worked out in our favour. With gym badge number 4 in our grasp, all that was left was to heal the team. We placed Paperweight back into the PC, retrieving Buddy, and after thinking it over, we bid our farewell to Patrick. It would have been cool to have a slow bro on the team for sure, it just didn't seem feasible as we would have to carry him into the late 30s before he evolved. With Hydra already ready to go, it just didn't make sense to me to leave such a powerful asset to rot in the PC. It was a tad concerning having three water types on the team I won't lie, but they all had their own strengths and weaknesses so it didn't seem too problematic at the time. As a bit of grinding on the way to Olivine, the rest of our party caught up in level, and once we reached Olivine City, failure made us aware of the sick Pokemon at the lighthouse. Before we helped out though, I explored the new city and obtained the good from the local fisherman and the shark beat from the lady on the beach. During this time we received the strength HM from another fisherman and caught our olivine fishing encounter, a crabby that I named Mr. Krabs. The only thing left to do here was take out the trainers in the lighthouse and help out the sick Pokemon so we can challenge for our next gym badge. Upon reaching the top of the lighthouse, Olivine's gym leader Jasmine informs us on the situation and asks us to gather a special medicine from the pharmacy in Seamwood. With little choice, we trudge our way through the sea routes, avoiding the trainers along the way in the process. By the time we finally land in Seamwood, we gained another two encounters from the journey, a tentacruel along Route 40 that I named Squidward, and his younger sibling Squillium the Tentacruel on Route 41. 
Continuing the Spongebob namesakes, my leg the magic carp graced the PC as our Saiyan Wood fishing encounter. With the pharmacy naturally being our fifth stop, we obtained the secret portion from the owner before taking on Chuck in our fifth gym battle. In sharp contrast to the tense battles of our last few gym fights, Chuck's team was thankfully a lot easier to prepare for. He only has two Pokemon, Primate with a pretty trash moveset and his ace Polyrath. Stat wise, neither Pokemon are nothing to sneeze at, but their typing and movesets let them learn quite a bit. Even his ace Polyrath wasn't anything too spectacular either. Once again, sleep hacks were a possibility, however we still had the mint berry from before to contend with that. Polyrath also had Surf, yet most of our team resisted to begin with, alongside a combination of Mind Reader and Dynamic Punch. Dynamic Punch is a powerful fighting type move with a guarantee to confuse the opponent. However, it is extremely inaccurate, so even if you use Mind Reader to guarantee that it will connect, that's still a two turn clock to even get it off in the first place. Given that we also had the Bitterberry to heal the confusion, it's safe to say I was very confident going in this time around. You'd think Chuck would be smart enough to get a nice type move on the Polyrath to deal with his obvious weakness to flying in grass, but nope. To be on the safe side, I deposited Senny in the PC giving his obvious weakness as a normal type and retrieved Mars. And after a little bit of grinding, Mars evolved into Hypno. Rage also adorned his final evolution into a Feraligator, providing a much needed boost to the team. With Buddy clearing out several of the gym trainers beforehand, it was finally time to take a crack at the Cyanwood gym leader. Giving both Hydra and Rage Mintberries to deal with the Hypnosis, Chuck sent out his Primate while Buddy led the charge holding the Sharp Beat. Buddy makes the first move landing clean with a quick attack that makes a dent in Primate's HP. He responds with a leader that lowers Buddy's defence before outspeeding with Fury attack. Fortunately, it only landed twice allowing Buddy to finish Primate Pop with a Sharp Beat boosted Gust. With only his Polyrath left to deal with, we recall Buddy for Rage predicting the Hypnosis. Instead, Chuck opts for Dynamic Punch and misses ensuring the free switch. Rage uses Scary Face ensuring all of our other Pokemon can outspeed Polyrath if we need to switch out going forward, and Polyrath lands a Dynamic Punch forcing us to switch out. Hydra came out next and the following Dynamic Punch missed its mark, allowing us to counter attack with Dragon Rage. With a set damage output of 40, Polyrath eats it up and responds with another Dynamic Punch, forcing us to switch out again. At this point, I have no idea why I didn't give the bitter berry to anybody like I planned. It honestly left my mind until I realised during the fight. We bring out Mars and of course the Polyrath lands hypnosis putting him to sleep. Instead of switching I decided to just run the course of the star statement until we were forced back into Hydra after a number of powerful surfs. Hydra tanks the surf upon the switch and we respond with a bite hoping to flinch. The damage was practically non-existent and we failed to flinch. Polyrath's hypnosis misses again and at this stage we're just relying on Dragon Rage with a set amount of damage to finish him off. Overall, the battle was relatively clean, albeit time consuming. If I managed my items better, we could have avoided the hypnosis on Mars, and maybe Surf might have done more than Dragon Rage, but I had my doubts in that case. The set damage of Dragon Rage just felt like the safer option, regardless, the Storm Badge was now ours. With 5 gym badges to our name, the only thing left for us to do here was to talk to a lady outside who reveals herself as Chuck's wife. As promised, she hands us the Fly HM and we immediately teach it to Buddy. Before departing, we place Mars back in the PC and we withdraw Whoop Whoop. Upon returning to Olivine, we make our way through the lighthouse and give Jasmine the secret potion, restoring the Ampharos back to good health. Jasmine thanks us and heads back to the gym in preparation of our battle. Jasmine's team revolves around the newly discovered steel types, and as a whole, she's again one of the easier battles of this run. She starts with two Magnemites that gain the steel typing as a secondary type, sporting a balanced moveset of attacks that can inflict status, such as paralysis and confusion, alongside a powerful sonic boom and thundershock. Given our Whoopoop is immune to electric attacks, the strategy for this was rather simple. I gave Whoopoop a better berry to deal with Supersonic, confident that Magnemite Sonic Boom wouldn't deal too much damage. At this point, Whoopoop learned Earthquake, providing a 4 times effective move to truly shake up Jasmine's team. Her ace is the evolution of Onyx, Steelix, and just like Onyx, this Leviathan of Steel is incredibly durable when it comes to physical attacks. Its special defense on the other hand is a complete joke, and with a weakness to water, our victory seems secured. Jasmine opens up with a Magnemite and we bring out Whoopoop and use Earthquake. Thankfully, we outspeed and her first Magnemite bites the dust for critical hit. In response, she brings out her ace and Whoopoop hits hard with Surf, taking it down to the red. Steelix responds with Sunny Day, weakening our water attacks, and Jasmine heals him with a Hyper Potion. I believe this is the first time a gym leader has actually done this so far, actually. Anyway, we continue using Surf, taking advantage of Steelix's abysmal special defense. However, thanks to Sunny Day, it does far less damage this time around. Regardless, the next Surf brings Steelix back down to the red, and the third finishes it off after Whoopoop ate an Iron Tail. With only Magnemite remaining, one final Earthquake was was all it takes to earn our 6th gym badge. High on our clean sweep, we return to Equity City and traverse Mount Mortar to move ahead. I could have used Served here, but I didn't for some reason. 
Our next objective was clear. Head to Mahogany Town to take on Price and his ice type Pokemon. Along the way, we battled the trainers littered around the routes and encountered a number of fresh blood keen to join our team. Route 42 was home to a Zubat I named Sue, and the next route had further surprises in store. On our way to the Lake of Rage, we were lucky enough to nab our first electric type of the run, Sparky the Mareep. Sparky in particular made me extremely excited as it added diversity in terms of our type pool as well as finally having a Pokemon that could put the magnet held item we received a while back to great use. Once arriving at the Lake of Rage we clearly see something is amiss. The once tranquil lake filled with Magikarp has been disrupted by the sudden appearance of many Gyarados, including the Shiner. Before we deal with them however, we take the chance to catch our Lake of Rage encounter via headbutt, Eggman the Execute. With that out of the way we take on the Red Gyarados, surprisingly it was a lot tougher than I anticipated, though eventually we overcame it, leaving a red scale in its wake. After the battle, we were approached by the Dragon Master himself, Lance. Lance asks for our help in solving the mystery and we rendezvous at the Shady House in Mahogany Town to get some answers. Beforehand, we trained Sparky at the Lake of Range, eventually evolving it into a Flaffy and then Ampharos. With that out of the way, we meet up with Lance who has a fetish of physically assaulting random people with his Dragonite, exposing Team Rocket's hideout in the process. Teaming up with Lance, we take on the Rocket Grunts and Admins, re to Failure who got his cheeps collapsed by the Champion, and force the Electrodes to faint, stopping the radio signal in its tracks. It's around this time we add King to the team, with the intention of making him a permanent member once we get the Moonstone from the Tojo Falls. Before we go any further, I just want to bring up a certain issue I came across whilst preparing for Price. You see, throughout the course of this Nuzlocke, I was setting up the level cats after beating the respective gym leaders. I didn't preemptively check beforehand as I wasn't entirely sure just how far I would have gotten. Because of the lack of foresight, I was completely oblivious to the fact Price's Pokemon for some reason are weaker than the previous two gym leaders before him. At this point, every single party member aside from Sparky was over the level cap. Unfortunately, the fault lies with me for not checking this out when I first started the run. Regardless, I find it bloody stupid why this is even a thing in the first place. So in the end, I had a choice to make. I had enough Pokemon in the PC to craft a brand new team specifically for this gym battle, or I could forgo the level cap for this gym and have the level cap set to 40 once I beat Price for Claire. In the end, I went with the latter. I'm sorry, but I just don't have the time to spend several real life hours getting a whole new team to level 31. If this technically means I've lost a Nuzlocke, then so be it. It's just a stupid occurrence and I have no idea why Price isn't earlier in the game. But for a few future runs I'll learn from this and be better prepared for the next time. As for Price, his team isn't too difficult. To start off with, he uses the Seal Evolutionary line, with their movesets being identical, a handful of Ice moves that have the chance to lower a handful of stats, headbutt to flinch and also rest to heal any battle damage. His ace in the form of a level 31 Pillar Swan makes use of its high attack with Fury attack, all the while hitting hard with a combination of Icy Wind and Blizzard. It can even prevent any attacks that lower stats with miss. Unfortunately, Ice types can be considered rather frail and that's certainly the case for this battle. Before taking him on, we deposited Buddy in the PC for Senna, who also was over the level cap but only by two levels. Price opens up his seal and we send out Sparky who was holding the magnet at this point. We outspeed and the boosted thunder punch takes out his first mon in one blow. Price brings out his ace Pillow Swine and we switch out into Rage because of the immunity to electric. Pillow Swine uses mist to prevent its stats from lowering and we take it out with Surf. Finally, Duo makes his appearance and thanks to his fixation on using Headbutt, Rage is powered up to the point where we take him down with a little trouble. I felt really bad about this fight and I still do looking back. It feels like I've cheated but it was an honest mistake to make, so what can I really do at this point? Definitely something to learn from for future runs. Regardless, we win our 7th gym badge and move forward on the road to Blackthorn City. It turns out, Team Rocket is still up to the old tricks once we receive a call from Professor Elm letting us know something was a missing goldenrod. Before heading out, I took the time to place Sunny back in the PC, retrieving Buddy so we could fly there as soon as possible. Once we get there, we find the radio tower completely taken over by Team Rocket, holding the director hostage. With little choice, we battle our way through the waves of rat cakes and coffins, switch training King along the way who eventually evolved into Nidorino. Most of the battles were one-sided enough. We eventually reached the director, or more accurately, the Rocket executive posting as the director, just like the rest he succumbs to Rage's serve and we discover the location of the true director, being held hostage in the warehouse placed in the underground we battled through earlier. Once we pick up the basement key, we head there immediately to put Team Rocket to bed once and for all. Keeping up with this tradition, Bellier appears out of nowhere and yet again challenges us to a battle. Again, this caught me off guard, and as a result, this encounter was much harder than it had any right to be. Bellier starts with his newly evolved Gulbar and I send out King as I was switch training him at the time. Naturally, I switch into Sparky as King was in no state to battle. Gulbar responds with Confused Ray and it bloody hits. Instead of switching out, I take the gamble knowing the Gulbar will go down with one Thunder Punch. However, he outspeeds and connects with Bite. We are spared from the flinch but we hit ourselves in confusion. We go for Thunder Punch again and the 
same scenario plays out leaving Sparky with just over half HP remaining. I should have switched out but given the fact Thunder Punch was a guaranteed kill I felt comfortable enough to take the risk. So much so that we try it one more time and sure enough Sparky hits himself in confusion again forcing the switch into Hydra. Hydra tanks the following bite and after two surfs the Golbat finally goes down. If you think the Golbat was a hassle just watch what happens next. Failure's Magnemite was up next and we bring out Whoop Whoop out in the T-Wave. One with Quake and it was all she wrote for the poor electric bolts. Meganium was to follow and this is where the battle went downhill pretty quickly. Not wanting to lose Whoop Whoop to a 4 times effective attack, we switched to Buddy banking on the sharp beat boosted fly to take them out. Meganium follows that plan immediately with Reflect and then outspeeds to paralyze Buddy with Body Slam. The one time you need it not to inflict paralysis I swear. For some reason I went for Whirlwind, I think at the time I wanted to take out Failure's remaining Pokemon to stall out the Reflect. Whirlwind goes through and Sneasel is sent out. We bring out Rage and he eats the faint attack. Sneasel outspeeds Rage and lowers his defense for Leah, however after two surfs it goes down with ease. At this stage my plan worked and Reflect fades out as Failure switches back to Meganium. Realizing now that having three water types might not have been the smartest plan ever, I decide the best course of action given the circumstance was to outspeed the Meganium with Slash. It connects and does a decent amount of damage. Meganium responds with a critical hit Razor Leaf, leaving Rage in the yellow forcing the switch into Hydra. Hydra tanks the following Razor Leaf that was also a bloody crit. Outspeeding the Meganium we go for Dragon Rage for the guaranteed set damage. The result brings Meganium down to the yellow as he responds with another Body Slam. Thankfully it doesn't paralyze this time allowing us to end it with another Dragon Rage. With only Haunter remaining we switch back to Whoop Whoop who gets hit by Mean Look, followed by a Shadow Ball. Whoop Whoop eats both and finishes the Haunter in one shot with a critical hit Surf. Everything that could have went wrong, went wrong in this battle. From the Confusion hacks hitting 3 times in a row, to the Paralysis on Buddy and the two back to back critical hits with Razor Leaf. All of this compounded with the fact that we just weren't prepared to face him. If CBD was on the team instead of King, we could have simply switched out and killed him again in with Acid. But I just wasn't expecting to face failure here of all places. I guess the important thing is, we didn't lose any Pokemon here and we are free to continue onward. Fortunately, the rest of this detour went remarkably well. We took out the rest of the rocket grunts with ease, and even though the gate puzzle took me far too long to solve, we eventually saved the director and he hands us the card key we need to unlock the gate in the radio tower. I forfeited my encounter in the underground base which was a coughing, simply because I didn't want to risk the self-destruct, and we returned to the radio tower to put an end to the inconveniences for good. Instead of going back right away though, I made a quick detour whilst we were in Goldenrod to the department store, buying a few copies of the respective TMs or the elemental punches I intended to teach King in the future. With everything resolved, we returned to the radio tower blowing past the many grunts and executives with relative ease, until we stood face to face with the leader of this farce. The executive leads with Houndor and Senny led the charge on our end. With a stab headbutt, the Houndor was no match and next up was his coughing. Seeing no reason to switch, Senny attacks again with headbutt to try and get the flinch. It doesn't and the coughing tanks the hit. After a back and forth, Senny eventually whittles down the HP of the coughing with another headbutt before finishing it off with a swift quick attack, leading the executive to switch into his ace Houndoom. With Senny's job complete, we switch to Hydra and the successive smoke unfortunately poisons our sea dragon. Even with the status infliction, Hydra takes the Houndoom down to the red with a single surf, inevitably finishing it off on the next turn. Team Rocket finally concedes defeat and with the silver wing in hand we are finally free to take on our final gym battle. From the east of Mahogany Town, I try my luck with Headbutt on Route 44, hoping to nab a Heracross. This didn't work out as we encountered an Apom. This was a failed encounter as CBD's of Sorb accidentally killed it, so we moved on. Battling every trainer in our way, we eventually made it to the Ice Path, where we nabbed our next encounter, a Swinub. I named him Manny after the Mammoth in the Ice Age films. Through solving the many puzzles of the Ice Path and exploring the chasms, we found the Waterfall HM that we need going forward and we finally reached our next destination. After healing at the local Pokemon Center, I was keen to explore the area and seek out potential encounters. As such we explored a lake behind the gym and caught yet another magic cart named Penna. On Route 45 we encountered a Graveler who pretty much self-destructed leaving us empty handed. Things didn't seem to look up either as we encountered a warm effect in the dark cave and despite catching it, it did succeed in almost giving me a heart attack. On a positive note, after a bit of grinding to bring our team towards the level cap, Buddy finally evolves into Pidgeot. The only thing left for us to do here was to head for the gym and take on Claire. Claire is considered to be one of the hardest gym leaders in the game and I can see why honestly. For what it's worth she hosts a powerhouse of a team, three Dragonairs all with Thunderwear to immobilize the opposition, Dragon Breath as a stand move and even a variety of TMs to bolster their versatility, from Surf to Ice Beam. If that wasn't harsh enough, her Kindred continues to hack shenanigans with Smoke Screen, along with powerful stand moves in Surf and Dragon Breath, top 
topping all of this off with Hyper being to blow the opposition away. Under any other circumstances, I would have been worried when building my team for this one, but ironically enough, I remained calm. The main reason why was Whoop Hoop. With his immunity to electric attacks, the Thunder Wave posed no threat, and with the Ice Punch TM we bought from the department store, I was sure we could take them out with little concern. Even though Kingdra shouldn't be too difficult to take out either, having a variety of Pokemon with the advantage over Water and Dragon was a huge benefit here. The battle begins with Claire sending out her first Dragonair, and we respond with Whoop Hoop. Thanks to the Quick Claw, we speed, and the Ice Punch reduced the Servant's HP to the yellow range. Her Dragonair hits back with Surf, and Whoop Hoop naturally tanks the hit. We once again out speed, and the second Ice Punch was all it takes to take her down. Next up was the second Dragonair, and considering how easily we took out the first, I was content with allowing Whoop Hoop to continue battling. Out speeding the second Dragonair as well, our Ice Punch brings it down to the red. She responds with Dragon Breath, which unfortunately paralyzes Whoop Hoop. To be blunt, this did catch me by surprise. I completely forgot Dragon Breath had a chance to paralyze, and so I foolishly assumed the ground typing would prevent such from happening. I was reluctant to switch out though as Whoop Hoop held the Quick Claw so he still had the chance of it speeding regardless. In the end, we go for another Ice Punch and the Quick Claw pops, defeating the second Dragonair. With the arrival of Claire's final Dragonair, we stay in and go for Ice Punch again. This time, the Dragonair outspeeds and hits us with Ice Beam for a decent chunk of damage. However, Whoop Hoop responds with Ice Punch bringing her down to the red once again. Even though Whoop Hoop was under half health at this point, she was still far from crit range, so we stayed in and went for Ice Punch. The following Ice Beam brings her down to the crit range before we finished it with a final Ice Punch. With only Kingdra remaining, I thank our lucky stars that the paralysis didn't come into play here. Whoop Hoop had pretty much fulfilled her role in this battle, and as such we switched into Rage on the Kingdra so we could tank the following Surf. Before going for an Ice Punch, I decide Scary Face is the better option, just in case we have to switch out at any point and Kingdra misses its smart screen. Thank God. The following Ice Punch did okay damage. I'm guessing because of the part water typing helped with tanking it, and Kingdra hit hard with a hyper beam in response. Knowing that she had to wait a turn to recharge, I take the opportunity to switch out into Sparky and hit the Kingdra with a magnet boosted Thunder Punch, but even with the boost, Kingdra still tanks the hit and lands a smart screen. Regardless, we go for Thunder Punch again, knowing it's a rap if it lands, and sure enough, it does, taking Kingdra out and winning us our final Joso gym battle. Aside from Whitney, this was probably the gym battle I was the most cautious of. However, having Whoop Hoop on the team here really paid dividends, locking half the Dragonair's move pools away. And despite somewhat regressing having three water types on the team previously, having the ability to tank her Kindred's strongest moves certainly gave us the edge in this battle. Even though we kicked her ass, Claire still refuses to accept her defeat, and forces us to go and take a test in the Dragon's Den located in the cave behind the gym. What's with the Jolto gym leaders being so salty anyway? Anyway, once we heal, we head into the cave in search of the Dragon Claw. Whilst here, we caught our next encounter, Spyro the Dratina. Overall, a really cool Pokemon, and if we could get it to level 55, having a Dragonite on the scene could really help our chances in the post game. After locating the Dragon Claw, Claire gives us our final gym badge and the TM Dragon Breath. I decide to give Hydra the Dragon Claw just in case it came up at some point, and with all 8 gym badges we return home to where it all began, in preparation of our next challenge. Returning home we visit our mother who seems to be doing well, and the professor who gave us the Master Ball, before heading east from New Bart Town en route to the Pokemon League. The first obstacle in our way was the Tojo Falls. I made it a priority to get the Moonstone here as I planned prior for King to replace CBD at the Pokemon League. Overall, Nido King is just a far better poison type than Gloom, and with his YTM move pool including the elemental punches, I couldn't pass up on the sheer versatility. As we made it out to the other side, finally arriving in the Kanto region, our team took on any challenger found along the following routes. This included multiple encounters in the form of Solid Snake the Arbok on Route 27, and Ember the Ponytar via Route 26. It was great to finally have a fire type at our disposal, though I was kinda surprised it took us this long to even encounter one in the first place. Eventually, the victory road laid in our sights, where we caught a Don fan I named Elmer. With Jozo having honestly one of the easier victory rolls in the series, nothing of interest really happened here. Before long we found the exit as well as the Earthquake TM I planned to teach King, which led to our final encounter with Failure, and honestly the only time I was actually prepared to face him. After Failure's usual corny speech, the battle begins. He leads with Sneasel and we bring out Rage. Rage hits with a powerful Surf that almost takes it out, and Sneasel responds with Screech that thankfully misses. A final Surf and a Sneasel eventually goes down. Failure's next mob Magneton showed up next, and we switch into Whoop Whoop to out the Thunder Wave. Earthquake hits and the Magneton is out for the count. Meganium is brought out, and for some reason I stay in with Whoop Whoop and go for Ice Punch. Thankfully, we don't get punished by this as the Meganium poisons us with Poison Powder, and after the Ice Punch does decent damage, we force a switch into Buddy. This time, Meganium does go for the Razor Leaf, which Buddy tanks. With Fly, we avoid the Poison Powder and his starter goes down. Golbat comes out, and instead of switching into Sparky, we go for Quick Attack that deals okay damage. I think this was the right move as the Golbat's Confuse Ray hits, and we are forced to switch out. Unfortunately, Golbat outspeeds again and lands the Confuse Ray. Sparky hits himself in Confuse 
occasion twice and we get extremely unlucky with the flinch on the bite, forcing a switch into Rage who thankfully outspeeds, KOing Gobat with a single Ice Punch. His Haunter meets a similar fate, as all it takes is one Surf to take it out. Failure's final Pokemon was a Kadabra that also got one-shotted with Surf. With that out of the way, we bid our final farewell to our rival, now that we had finally reached the Pokemon League. To be perfectly honest, I hadn't a clue as to how I should approach the level cap here. So after looking up the individual teams, I decided on a level cap of 44, this being the level of Lance's weakest Pokemon. I thought this was fair at the time as every member of the Elite 4 bar will have at least one Pokemon over level 44. All that was left was the team building which ended up being the easiest part of this entire process. I bounced ideas back and forth, however ultimately I was confident that the team we had already was competent enough to get us through. The only change I made going in was replacing CBD for King. After a long grinding session I taught King Earthquake and Ice Punch, as well as Dragon Breath to Hydra because of the Dragon Claw and its absurd attack stat. With all the money we accumulated up until this point, I stocked up on four restores and moved on to challenge our first opponent. Will's the first member of the Elite Four, and on the surface, his team didn't look too bad. He has a diverse set of powerful psychic types, with secondary typing to boot. The standout Pokemon on his team for me would definitely have to be the statues with the potential of hacking you out of the battle, and his slow bro, an incredibly bulky Pokemon that could get even bigger with Amnesia and Curse. To deal with Satu as soon as possible, we leave his Sparky's Thunder Punch, and even with the level differential, the Satu still outspeeds and lands the Confuse Ray. Suddenly we find ourselves in an uphill battle as Sparky hits himself in confusion. Satu's Psychic hits hard, however Sparky was able to fight off the confusion and retaliate with Thunder Punch taking it out with one blow. Jinx was next and I decided to switch out, planning to finish her with Wupu's Earthquake. This didn't really go to plan either, as Lovely Kiss lands putting Wupu to sleep. The only option was to stay in and hope Wupu would wake up relatively quickly. I believe this is the first time the hardcore rules really worked against us here, and unfortunately so did the hacks as Wupu stays asleep allowing Jinx to hit incredibly hard with Psychic. Being very close to the crit range made the next move difficult. I didn't want to lose Wupu this early on in the run, however she was a liability under sleep. In the end we stay in and Psychic brings her close to death. She finally wakes up, destroying the Jinx with a single earthquake. His Ekitor comes out and naturally we switch into Buddy. Buddy tanks the Psychic that puts him in the crit range and in the end we use Fly, hoping the Sharp Beat will be enough to take him out. We are outplayed however as the Ekitor uses Reflect, which greatly reduces the blow of our physical attacks. Psychic lands again, bringing Buddy down to the red. At this stage, the only way Fly would kill would be due to a crit. It's simply a risk that would be idiotic to take, so we switch into Rage as the Executor's only grass move was Leech Seed, forcing us to tank the Psychic. Rage is the first to move and manages to take him down with a single Ice Punch, playing around the Reflect successfully. As Slowbro made his appearance, Sparky is called out, hoping to deal with it before Will has the chance to increase its stats. Instead of attacking, Slowbro did indeed raise its special defense with Amnesia, and Sparky paralyzes with Thunder Wave. With Sparky lingering in crit range after a Psychic, we push on with Thunder Punch that did a ton of damage even with the plus 2 special defense. Psychic kicks again and Sparky just barely hangs on by the skin of his teeth. The following Thunder Punch does enough to take the Slowbro down, leaving Will down to his final Satu. I wasn't confident that Sparky could outspeed, thus making the switch into Rage. The attack does more than what I would have liked, so we switch into Hydra who is pretty beefy much to my surprise. After a back and forth, the Satu lands yet another Confuse Ray, forcing Hydra to hit himself with the following Psychic rubbing salt into the wound. With no reaction, I bring out King, and Satu almost kills it with a single Psychic, however King manages to hang on. Outspeeding speeding this bloody bird and finally putting an end to this battle with a ferocious ice punch. We survived the battle with no casualties, but it did shape me up quite a bit. I didn't expect Will to be so difficult, however it was certainly my own fault for the oversight. When it came to building this team, I did so under the assumption that Lance himself would be the toughest out of the lot, and here we were almost losing to the first member. Once we regained our composure and healed the team, we moved on to face Koga. Needless to say, after that complete travesty of a battle, I was cautious going into this next one. Given King's inherent resistance to poison, alongside his stab earthquake, it made the more sense for him to lead the team this time around. As expected, King's powerful earthquake wrecks havoc upon Koga's Ariados, KOing the spider with a critical hit. Venomoth appeared and despite having wings, fell victim to the second earthquake. Surprisingly, it survived and clapped back with Psychic, however the retaliating ice punch did enough to take it out. Koga called forth his Forager Snakes and I decided to switch out into Woopoo. Unfortunately, thanks to the spikes, I needed to think twice about switching going forward. Regardless, Fortress's Protect defended him from Wipoot's Surf. The next did connect and brought it down enough for a two-hit KO. Whilst the Swift connected, it ultimately did minor damage, allowing Wipoot to take out the Fortified Shell with another Surf. His Crobat was next and I opted to stay in, landing an Ice Punch after Crobat's Toxic missed its mark. The Ice Punch paves away to another two-hit KO, and once Wipoot tanks a Wing Attack, Crobat meets its end. Koga's last Pokemon Muck wasn't too much of a threat either, falling to a crit earthquake, restoring my confidence in the team as we moved on to Bruno.
Out of the four, I still consider Bruno to be one of the easy Elite Four members. For the record, his team has improved since his last appearance with the introduction of Hitmontop, though he still retains Anonyx for some reason. Out of his team, the two that worried me the most was the Hitmonchan and his Machamp. His Hitmonchan spot in the Elemental Punches ensured I couldn't just sweep with Buddy, which complicated things somewhat, whilst Machamp is just a machine in of itself. Even more so, its move pool has been vastly upgraded since Generation 1. For starters, it actually has tight coverage now with Rock Slide, and moves such as Vital Throw and Cross Chop guaranteed we wouldn't be escaping this one without taking a substantial beating. To start on a good note, we leave with Buddy, and after taking a quick attack, Buddy responds with Fly, which unfortunately gets countered by Detect. Instead of wasting PP, we switch into King, aiming to KO the hit on top with Earthquake. He survives, and as expected, goes to Dig, allowing us to deal even more damage with Earthquake, finishing him off. Hitmonchan is then brought out and because of its moveset I'm reluctant to switch out. Eventually we go for Earthquake that lines up a 2 hit KO, as Hitmonchan retaliates with Ice Punch that honestly did less than I anticipated. A final Earthquake takes down Bruno's second Pokemon and he brings out Hitmonlee. Seeing no reason to switch out, King continues his Earthquake shenanigans taking out the Hitmonlee in a single hit. Onyx is next and we call Rage out to tank the Earthquake, Onyx then falling down to a single Surf. Machamp finally makes his appearance and we leave his scary face to slow it down. His responding cross chop inflicts major damage to Rage and forces to switch into Hydra. Thankfully, the next cross chop misses and we are free to counter with Waterfall. This barely scratches the surface and Bruno takes advantage of Hydra's dual typing through Rock Slide. In the end, I switch Hydra out for Whoop Whoop and the responding Rock Slide misses its mark. We retaliate with Surf, bringing Machamp into the yellow. Cross chop hits hard, does I switch out into Buddy and hoping to end this quickly with Fly. The cross chop once again connects, however, Buddy hangs on, finishing off the monstrosity with a single single fly. Only one Elite Four member stood in our way between us and the champion. The Dark Queen Karen was our next opponent. Karen is the user of the elusive dark type, and going in it was rather tricky to construct a game plan. None of our Pokemon were or had fighting type moves in the first place. Thankfully for the majority of our team that didn't matter, as they all held a secondary typing aside from a starter Umbreon. I also had to be wary of switching out due to the presence of Pursuit, a lesson I learned all the way back in Ectritique City. To start off with, we led with King, as I wanted to take out the Umbreon before it could get off any hacks. Focus Energy is used to raise the odds of a critical hit, and Umbreon lowers King's accuracy with Sand Attack. This fortunately didn't matter as the Earthquake hits which did okay damage. Umbreon responds with Confuse Ray, confusing King, though thanks to the Bitterberry I gave King before the battle started, he recovers but we miss our follow up, whilst the Umbreon continues to lower our accuracy with Sand Attack. The following Earthquake does land which brings Umbreon to the red, and after he once again confuses us, we switch into Rage to take him out. Rage tanks a Fane attack and finishes it off with Surf. Vileplume, the only non dark type on her team, was next, so I switched to Buddy to finish this off quickly. Vileplume hits the Sunspot and then outspeeds with Petal Dance. Despite the status infliction, I risk the fly, and Buddy is successful in landing it. Vileplume hangs on, and I take the opportunity to preemptively switch her into King, in an attempt to play around the pursuit of Karen's next Pokemon. After tanking a Petal Dance, we finish the Vileplume off through Ice Punch. Murkrow is released, and King clips the crow with an Ice Punch, taking it out. Karen calls her race out Houndoom, who outspeeds and hits King hard with a flamethrower. King thankfully survives and ends the Houndoom with a single earthquake. With only Gengar remaining, victory was in reach. We still had to be wary though because of the Destiny Bond. I wasn't entirely sure if King could outspeed the Gengar, so for some stupid reason I decided to switch out into an even slower Pokemon in Whoop Whoop. I guess I must have panicked here. I honestly don't know why I made this play, other than the Quick Claw. Gengar paralyzes Whoop Whoop with Lake, unfortunately goes for Curse instead of Destiny Bond, sealing the victory with a final earthquake. After such a shaky start in the first battle, we managed to take down the rest of the Elite Four with relative ease. We now stood face to face with our final challenge in Johto, the Pokemon League champion himself, Lance the Dragon Master. Lance's team is definitely one to behold. Not only is it balanced with powerful mons such as Gyarados, Aerodactyl and Charizard, he also uses free hacked Dragonite he PK hexed in, sporting some of the most powerful moves in the game. I wasn't sure if we could keep the clean sheets rolling and at this point I didn't really care. Since we had so many more potential encounters down the road in Kanto, my priority was to play aggressively, to be his team done with efficiency. As Gyarados was his lead, it was only natural to start with Sparky, one-shotting his Gyarados with a Thunder Punch. Dragonite is next and we switch to King to play around the paralysis. King hits hard with Ice Punch and the first Dragonite goes down to a critical hit. With Dragonite number 2, we continue the same strategy, however the Dragonite survives with a single HP and manages to connect with Blizzard. King is able to hang on though and we finish it off with another Ice Punch. Aerodactyl is brought out next, so I switch out the Wounded King for Rage. Rage tanks the following Hyper Beam before finishing the fossil off with a Surf whilst it recharged. 
The final Dragonite finally makes his appearance and we almost kill it with Ice Punch. He survives and hits Rage with another Hyper Beam, leaving our starter with a measly 14 HP. Rage once again finishes off his Dragonite with Ice Punch whilst he recharges from the Hyper Beam. With only Charizard left, we allow Wooproot to pick up where Rage left off, and after tanking another Hyper Beam, Lance's final Pokemon goes down to a couple of Surfs, winning us the battle and the title of the Pokemon League Champion. As if right on cue, Professor Oak and his cohorts show up and Lance takes us to the Hall of Fame to record our victory. And as the credits roll, we look back on the battles that brought us to this moment, as well as the challenges that still awaited us in the Kanto region. Returning to New Bark Town on the back of our victory, we visit Professor Elm and receive the SS ticket, allowing us to finally access Kanto. From the port in Olivine, we aboard the SS Aqua, taking out the trainers on board to kill time. We encounter our worried grandfather looking for his granddaughter, and once they reunite, the ship docks in Vermilion, giving us free reign over the region. With the dream in sight, I decide to explore the city and surrounding routes, catching an Abra on Route 6 that I originally named Magic. After surfing around the tree, blocking the path in an act of defiance, taking out the gym trainers was a simple feat, as we stood face to face with the electrifying Lieutenant Surge. Despite the exciting introduction, the same honestly cannot be said for the gym battle itself. In short, Wooproot destroyed his entire team with Earthquake, as the Lieutenant could do nothing but sit there and watch helplessly in the face of the ground type. Regardless, we win our first Kanto gym badge as we move on to greener pastures. From this point, I decided it's best to take on Erika and Celadon before my team level passed the cap. This time I did learn from my mistake and checked all the levels of the Kanto gym leaders beforehand and discovered that I would need to build an entirely new team for a few of them, Janine and Brock specifically. I accepted this and mapped out my route to gather the gym badge as quickly as possible. Along the next route we catch our next encounter, a Vulpix named Nine, and pressed on to Celadon City. Upon arriving, we explore the city and the department store for anything useful. Coming up empty handed we make our way to the gym in the hopes of attaining the Rainbow Badge. The gym trainers pose little threat with their grass types, and we eventually reach Erika. Full disclosure here, I kinda cheated by accident. For some reason I had the level cap and missed it in my head, and because of this I didn't realise King was actually over the level cap, so just keep that in mind going in. Erika starts with Tangela and King absolutely obliterates it with Ice Punch. King tries to do the same to the Victory Bell but it survives and bites back with Razor Leaf. King naturally attacks it before he could finish it off, Erika heals the Victory Bell with a high proportion. King once again connects with the Ice Punch and freezes the Victory Bell. This is where I realise the level cut situation and so I switch into Buddy for the remainder of the fight. Buddy takes out the Victory Bell with Fly and Erika brings out her Blossom. She opens up with Sunny Day and survives a Fly to get off a Solar Beam. Buddy tanks it though and finishes her off with a Quick Attack. With Jumpluff being our final Pokemon, I used Quick Attack to ensure the Fly would kill next turn. Jumpluff seeds Buddy with Leech Seed which doesn't matter as Buddy kills it with another Fly. I do feel bad about this, since it was a lapsing concentration on my part. Even without King's interference though, I still think we would have won regardless with Buddy, so I can't really say that this mistake would have changed the battle in any significant degree. Nevertheless, another win, another badge. From here, we backtrack to Saffron and head north on the road to Cerulean City. North on Route 5, we discovered there is an issue with the local power plant and catch our next encounter, a bell sprout named Hoover. Adding CBD back to the team, we take the opportunity to teach him Giga Drain and fight our way through the six trainers along Route 25. With Misty nowhere in sight, we decided to take the detour up Route 9 to the power plant, catching an Electrobus on Route 10 along the way and a match Hawk in the Rock Tunnel. Once we do reach the power plant, the manager tells us that an important gear had been stolen, with a shady character looking around Cerulean City, forcing us to go back to look for them. We eventually encounter them in the Cerulean gym to find yet another member of Team Rocket, with extremely broken English. Yeah, this hasn't aged well at all has it? Nevertheless he flees and we tail him. Upon defeating him in a battle, he tells us the location of the missing part, and we return it, bringing the power plant back to full operation. Free from any pressing obligations, we once again return to Cerulean and after interrupting Misty's date, we can finally get our crack at the Cerulean City Gym Leader. Misty starts with Golduck and I allow CBD to take charge. Her Golduck outspeeds and hits hard with Psychic, however a Miracle Seed boosted Giga Drain leaves her on a knife's edge while virtually restoring CBD to good health. After tanking another Psychic, the Golduck goes down to Acid. Her Quagsire is next and CBD crushes it with another Giga Drain, restoring the damage taken in the previous fight. Lapras comes out and we switch into Whoop Hoop. Blizzard misses twice taking the Lapras down to the red after two Earthquakes, before falling to the third. It did manage to get off a Perisong though, forcing the switch to Rage on a Starmie. Starmie confuses Rage and he ends up hurting himself in confusion going for Scary Face. After another Surf, he finally breaks out and lowers the Starmie's speed with Scary Face. Whilst his following Ice Punch did little damage, it did succeed in freezing her race. This allowed a clean switch into Sparker, who finished it off with another Thunder Punch. And just like that, we earned the Cascade Badge. 
With three gyms down, I decided to finally train up the second team to take on Janine and Brock. Upon realising I couldn't go down the cycling road as I forgot to pick up the bike in Johto, oops, we had to make a quick detour to Lavender Town so that we could pick up the Porky Flu expansion from the Kanto Radio Tower. After this we trekked the long way down Route 12, taking out the trainers on the way to Fuchsia City and catching yet another encounter on Route 15, Jade the Hoppit. Despite Janine's team being incredibly underleveled for this part of the game, she does use a well balanced squad with the likes of Crowbat and its confused hacks, the ever bulky Weezings with Toxic and of course Explosion. Regardless though, I felt confident our new team could handle the pressure. First things first, we deposited our main squad in the PC with Senna being the only returning member as he was eligible to take part in this fight. Next we withdrew Brock, Squidward, Mars, Nine and Manny from the PC, leveling them up to the late 30s. Since finding the Firestone was more trouble than it was worth, Nine stayed as a Vulpix so I did teach him Iron Tail for type coverage. Manny evolved from a swine onto pillar swine and I felt confident given the type advantage that we could take her team down without much hassle. The battle begins and we leave with Senna as Janine brings out Crobat. Hoping to finish this quickly, Senna goes for headbutt. Unfortunately, the Crobat does outspeed here and lands the Confused Ray which results in Senna hurting himself. Crobat then goes to Screech and we go for rest to at least heal the confusion. Since Senny was holding the Mint Berry, it felt like this was the player to make. Hax unfortunately wasn't on our side this time around as Senny breaks out and we pretty much waste a free rest. Crobat again outspeeds and hits us hard with wing attack. Senny does get off the headbutt yet it does little damage forcing us to switch into Squidward. The Confusion Ray hits again and we immediately switch out into Mana. Crobat then uses multiple screeches to lower Manny's defence and he finally ends it with a single Icy Wind. Aria doors his neck and I decide to keep Manny in the battle, making use of his heavy attack stat with headbutt. This pays off leaving Aria doors in the yellow, responding with a Nightshade that Manny tanks due to it being special, guaranteeing the kill with the following headbutt. Surprised to not see either of her wheezings yet, Janine calls for her Venom off and uses a dire hit to increase the chance of a critical hit. Manny uses Ice Wind and lowers the Venom off speed. We take the chance and use Icy Wind again, even though the damage isn't great. Though we do get lucky again and Venomoth is now minus 2 in speed. In response, Venomoth goes for double team and Manny finishes it off with another headbutt. With her two Weezings up next, we switch Manny out in fear of the explosion and bring Squidward out to deal with them. Her Weezing tries the Toxic, however we out it with Squidward. Squidward outspeeds and hits for big damage with Surf. The responding smog is eating up and Weezing goes down to another Surf. Same as before, Squidward continues to hit hard with Surf, finishing off her final Pokemon with a critical hit, earning us the Soul Badge and the TM Toxic. After exploring the rest of Fuchsia City, I finally decided to return to Saffron so we could take on Sabrina for the Mars Badge. Despite only having three Pokemon to work with, they were all extremely powerful, each of them sporting Psychic as their signature move, as well as other coverage to make up for their lackluster physical attacks such as Reflect, and a means of transferring those stats over at will through Baton Pass. Even with all this in mind, I was still confident our main team could handle her, though I was not taking this battle lightly by any means. Sabrina leads with Espeon while Sparky took charge on our end. My plan was to lessen the damage somewhat through Sparky's light screen. Espeon however outspeeds and hits Sparky hard with Psychic. Sparky does get off the light screen before getting hit again with Psychic, responding with a Thunder Punch of his own bringing Espeon into the yellow. Espeon again hits hard with Psychic before falling to a second Thunder Punch. With Sparky in no condition to continue, we switch into Wupu to land some physical damage through Earthquake. Sabrina sees this coming though, and Mr. Mime uses Reflect to mitigate the damage. Even with this, the Earthquake still hits hard and Wupu tanks the Psychic, though the light screen then wears off. The quick law apart from Mr. Man is left rocks by another earthquake, she manages to hang on connecting hard with another psychic with the light screen now being gone. Feeling confident in Wupu's ability to tank another psychic, we finish the Mr. Mime off with Surf, though we are forced to switch out on the Alakazam thanks to the damage we received in the previous battle. Buddy comes out hoping to end the fight with a boosted fly. Alakazam does deal a decent chunk of damage yet Buddy is able to eat it. The reflect thankfully fades at this moment and we avoid the next psychic thanks to fly. Surprisingly, Alakazam hangs on with 1 HP and hits Buddy again which leaves him at 2 HP. In the end, we use Quick Attack and Sabrina heals Alakazam with a Hyper Potion. The Quick Attack does put Alakazam in range of fly and Buddy is able to connect when he knows the Marsh Badge. For as close as this battle was at times, I'm happy we were able to get through it without any casualties. Yes, the safe play would have been to switch Buddy out as if Fly missed he would have been finished, however in these moments you have to be willing to take a risk, especially when you consider our other alternatives in the PC for flying anywhere. Heading back to Familion, we take out the Snorlax blocking the path to the Diglett Cave and make our way through to Pewter City. With Brock waiting, I made our final preparations, getting our second team up to the level cap as they were still too far under leveled for my liking. Replacing 9 for the returning CBD, we take out the gym trainers before coming face to face with Brock himself. All in all, his team is rather balanced to cover at least one of his weaknesses. His Geodudes have been replaced by a Graveler, Rhyhorn and the two fossils in Amistad and Kaputops, with moves like Giga Drain to help cover the weakness to water alongside powerful stab moves such as Earthquake. Despite all this though, Brock still has a major weakness to grass, and so I thought CBD's miracle boosted Giga Drain should be enough to claim yet another clean sweep. 
Regardless, Brock opens up with Reveler and Squidward leads the charge, raising his defense with Barrier. Reveler barely leaves the mark with Rollout before joining through Surf. Raihorn is next and suffers the same fate instantly, forcing Brock to switch into Omastar. With his water typing, we go for Acid instead, but it's resisted. Omastar's spike cannon isn't that impressive either, and he eventually goes down after a couple of surfs. The battle continues in this trajectory, as Kabutop scores down only after a handful of surfs, with Squidward achieving a clean sweep once the Onyx goes down to the same attack, earning us our sixth Kanto Gym Badge. Whilst I did expect us to win, I just wasn't really expecting the battle to be that one-sided. Aside from Sabrina, none of the cancelled gym leaders are really put up any sort of a fight, and I'd figured this would continue going into Blaine. Sure enough, that did seem to be the case. However, before that, I had a rather interesting battle with Cal in the trainer's school in Feridian. I wasn't entirely sure what this was at first, until I was staring down a similar looking trainer who had all three of the Johto starters. Cal starts off with Meganium and we bring out Rage. Immediately I switch into Buddy and he outspeeds the Meganium to hit with Fly. That 95 accuracy really really bit us in the ass and he missed, taking a body slam as a result. The following fly does connect though, putting Meganium in range for a 2 hit KO. Just like our battle with failure however, the second body slam paralyzes Buddy, so we go off a quick attack that does go through, leaving Meganium in the red. Meganium continues landing the body slam before going down to another quick attack. With Typhlosion up next, I bring out Rage again to hit with Surf. Typhlosion's flame bill is obviously resisted and Meganium's light screen fades, leaving Typhlosion at the mercy of Rage's Surf. Unfortunately, Flame Wheel does burn Rage, and like an idiot, I accidentally mispressed and used Screech, forcing Rage to take more damage from the burn than I would have liked. We actually used the right move next time, and Typhlosion finally goes down to Surf. With Rage in no state to take on his fellow compatriot, we switch into Sparky who takes a critical hit slash, before finishing him off with a single Thunder Punch. This wasn't an important battle per se, but I just thought I'd bring attention to it, since I had no idea this place was even a thing in the first place. Once we heal though, we travel through Route 1, heading south from Pallet to finally reach Cinnabar Island. Of course, time has not been kind to the people of Cinnabar since Generation 1, the volcano erupting wiping out a good portion of the island, including the Cinnabar Gym. We meet Blue and he asks us to come to the Viridian Gym to take him on. We had other matters on our hands right now though, surfing east to find Blaine homeless in a cave. He still challenges us though and we take on the fiery spirited gym leader. There isn't really a lot I can say about Blaine's team aside from Magma having sunny day to weaken water moves, and maybe it's my car though? But when you have three water types on your team, this battle was only going to go one way. Leading with Rage, we wreak havoc on his team, swiftly crushing them under the might of Surf. None of them really put up any sort of a fight and we move on with the volcano badge in hand. Poor Blaine man. After a bit of training, we return to Viridian, and we head to the gym to take on our final Kanto challenge, the former Pokemon League champion himself, Blue. Needless to say, his team is incredibly dangerous, forcing a party very similar to his original team in the first generation. Blue comes on with a diverse yet balanced set of powerful Pokemon that complement one another nicely. Instead of a Kanto starter, he instead uses the three substitutes in Gyarados, Executor and Arcanine, whilst retaining his Pidgeot and Alakazam. So for this battle, I plan to counter each of their strengths individually, rather than plan a strategy around his entire team. First up was his Pidgeot, thus we led with Sparky. His quick attack barely leaves a scratch, and Sparky clips those wings with a single Thunder Punch. Blue responds with Rhydon, and we switch into Hydra to take it out. Rhydon's Fury attack lands twice before ultimately falling to a ferocious waterfall. His Alakazam outspeeds Hydra with a Staff Psychic that doesn't do a whole lot to be honest, and with such a frail physical defense stat, naturally he falls to a single Hyper Beam. Hydra is forced to recharge, and his own Gyarados gives us a taste of our own medicine, guaranteeing a clean switch into Sparky in the process. Sparky swiftly takes him out with a 4 times effective Thunder Punch. With Executor's appearance, I decide to set up the Thunder Wave and the Light Screen before switching into Buddy. Buddy easily tanks a Solar Beam, bringing the Executor down to red with a fly and quick attack. Blue then heals using the full restore, taking the paralysis with it. So to get Executor back in range for fly, we use quick attack. Executor manages to hang on with a single hit point again and lands with another Solar Beam. Why won't he just go down? It gets testy when Blue yet again heals with a full restore, and with Buddy knowing the yellow, there was no guarantee that we could kill with fly. Knowing he would probably go for Solar Beam again, we go for another two quick attacks before avoiding the attack again with fly. It connects and we finally take down the Executor. His final Pokemon Arcanine stood firm, so we recall Buddy for Whoop Whoop. After tanking the flamethrower, the battle finally comes to a close with a critical hit surf. And just like that, our journey in Kanto comes to a close. As promised, we return to Pallet Town, and Oak gives us the permission to access Mount Silver, our location hosting the highest level wild Pokemon in the game, and the true Kanto champion himself, Red. If you know Pokemon, then you know who this character is, and of course he hosts the most powerful team in the game level-wise, possessing the three Kanto starters, as well as powerhouses in their own right, Snorlax and Espeon. We had to be on our air game to finally put this run to a close. The preparation for this fight actually didn't take as long as I thought it would. The experience points you get from defeating the Donphans and Rapidashes in the area quickly raised our team to level 77, and we entered the cave to take on our final battle. 
Ironically enough, this is one of the more easier battles. I'm not sure if it's because I knew his team well already, or the fact we could play without caution as this was the final battle, but I felt extremely comfortable going in with our usual team. The match begins and Red opens up with Pikachu. To get the early lead, we take him out with a swift earthquake after Pikachu's charm failed to leave its mark. Venusaur was next and I took a gamble here. Instead of switching out straight away, I decided to go for Ice Punch predicting the Solar Beam. Thankfully we were right, but I was aware of how badly this would have gone if Red chose Giga Drain. The Ice Punch brings Venusaur just above the yellow, and we immediately recall Whoopoot for Buddy so we can tank the Solar Beam, but it eats it up and we take out the Venusaur with Fly, though it does get off a sunny day lowering water damage going forward. Blastoise comes out and uses Rain Dance, so we take the opportunity to use his own weather against him, frying the turtle with an electrifying thunder. I was so proud of this moment by the way, Hydra knew Rain Dance as well but it never came up so it was great to turn Red's own weather against him. With Espeon appearing I wanted to make the most out of the rain so we go for another thunder. Espeon is speed though and it hits us with Psychic. The critical hit did do a lot, but it didn't matter as thunder one shots. Again we stay in and continue with the thunder strats. Even with the magnet boost, Snorlax is just a big booter, even more so with the use of Amnesia. Before switching out into Rage we paralyze the Snorlax, yet it breaks through and brings Spiky close to death for a body slam. With Rage raring to go we lower the defense of Red Snorlax to minus 6 through multiple screeches, finishing it off with a Nookwake. Red's final Pokemon Charizard takes the stage, outspeeding our paralyzed king with flamethrower as we go for Ice Punch. King hangs on though and deals a little bit of damage. Once we switch into Hydra however, Water Ball brings Charizard to its knees, allowing us to finish it off with another Waterfall. Red departs from Mount Silver in stunned silence, and just like that the credits roll. After 5 long years and countless hours, I have finally completed my first Pokemon Nuzlocke. Now if I had any closing thoughts, the turning point was definitely during our battle with Bugsy. After such a shaky start to the run, I was able to compose myself and actually consider all of the options available to build a cohesive team for the challenges ahead. I've also never been one to use multiples of the same type in my teams, so it was an interesting dynamic to see how our water types synergize with their respective strengths and weaknesses. Anyway, that's all from me, and if you enjoyed this video and want to see more challenge runs like this in the future, please consider subscribing. The support helps me out more than you know. Also, comment below what was your favourite moment in the run, and any suggestions for future runs you may have going forward. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.